afternoon, gang. Come on at the back, come on, down the front, don't be afraid. Um, thank you for having me, it's good to be here. I was gonna say, I think I'm gonna be the least equipped to talk Web3, uh, and then Jason Fox comes on this morning and starts talking about jumping out of Apache helicopters and frankly blowing any of what I'm about to say out of the water. Uh, what a good start to a conference that was. My background is somewhat different. Um, I started life at 23 years old, running a digital agency where fans were very important to us. Everything that we did was about fandom um, and about creating fans and leveraging fans. So our agency was the first agency in the world to market a TV show using social media where we created fans around a property, around a new television program, before anyone had even seen a trailer, for example. I then moved to a football media business called Copper 90, where it was quite literally built for fans. It was about turning the camera around 180 degrees and focusing on the emotion, uh, the sort of vociferous fandom that naturally occurs when people watch football. There wasn't a ball kicked, it was all about the emotion of fans. I was in music for a while too. I get about, you see, and at Defected Records, fandom is, of course, everything. One of the things you might have been fortunate enough to see was during the pandemic, when we had to stop all our events, uh, close all the gigs, stop the festivals. We put on virtual activity, virtual festivals around the world with everyone from Carl Cox to Idris Elba playing. And it was about trying to bring something to fans in a moment where they maybe needed it the most. So this fueling of fandom, these creating moments that matter, and breeding this feeling of what it is to be a fan has been like a red thread through my whole career. Now, I run a consultancy called Iconic. We've pulled all of those disparate elements together from sports and music and fashion and style and all of those bits in between. And we work for brands, giving them a cue jump to the front of popular culture, or so we say. Now, Iconic was born with that sort of feeling because actually, there's a whole bunch of points in history, whether it be sports or music, that were never instantly iconic. Jimi Hendrix burning his guitar, my beloved Man United when Cantona did a kung fu kick. I'm not saying it was good, but it was definitely an iconic moment. Or the greatest piece of music marketing that has ever been achieved and done was when the Beatles stood on top of Savile Row roof and delivered an unbelievable gig when no one else had ever done that before. The point is, it took those people it took that solitary tripod with 22 people on a roof to gather, to talk, to discuss, to share. It took a bunch of people on the street below to coalesce around this moment, to share the stories of the thing they'd seen too. That is an innate fandom, and that's what it's all about. So today, when I'm with such kind of Web3 luminaries, with technological kind of big thinkers, with people who understand the premise of AI, that's got a pretty big impact on what fans and fan communities is going to be, certainly when you're considering things like culture. Now, fandom goes back a hell of a long way. 1893, for Christ's sake. Sherlock Holmes was apparently the first example of that fandom, when books were writing about the tales of Sherlock Holmes killed him off. And it was widely considered to have comprised the first modern fandom when public demonstrations spilled out into the street because they couldn't believe what they had read. Likewise, it was only a few years later, in 1897, we saw the first fan fiction. People were making their own alternate storylines, non-linear storytelling, in 1897. Never mind the MCU and the Marvel Universe, that's pretty deep. Now, most people's association with fandom might be more reminiscent of maybe my own. I'm showing my age, but in the 80s, I was a big Duran Duran fan, Simon Le Bon and all the gang. Hopefully there's a couple of you my age that will at least know who the hell Duran Duran even are. But the point is, we sent off like 10 quid a year, and we got back our little cherished pack of sort of fan club paraphernalia, a little kind of gift card, a, a membership card with a membership number saying, we're an exclusive part of this club, extolling our love for this kind of band. This was all we had to express it. And it goes back to the 50s. The music industry had the first fan club models, Elvis Presley, the Beatles in the 60s. But then cut to 20 years ago, much, much more up to date, but still a while ago now, geek theory and nerd theory erupted. Not least because big tech, the owners of Google, are geeks and nerds in their own right, 
but it meant that actually that these passions that people pursued that used to be a bit frowned upon, seen as being in the margins, comic book collectors, Star Wars figures lovers, they are fans exhibiting true passion. And for the first time in decades, they were given the credit and the kudos that they actually warranted and they deserved. Fan theory and geek theory suggested that suddenly the fans were inheriting the earth. Now, what we did within broadcasting back in the noughties was simply take that love and devotion and passion around a property and get it out there to wherever audiences might be. We made bespoke content experiences, put them distinct to the platforms that they were best suited to, and got people into the idea of a TV program. We found it nonsensical that you would market television with a big billboard and a logo in a corner and telling you to tune in in three weeks' time. Because in those three weeks, you would be bombarded with probably two million pieces of comms information, and you're expected to retain and remember that singular name and brand and artwork to then tune in from one of 600 TV channels two weeks later. It's nonsensical. So what we did then was do it all through the power of fans. Get people into the music in the show, the styles, the fashions of the cast. Get them to create their own ideas. Use that latent fandom that existed. Now, many of you will, I'm sure, love Family Guy, but not all of you will realize that Family Guy is only still around now thanks to that early fan power, because Family Guy was canned. It wasn't canceled, maybe it should have been back then, but it simply wasn't deemed ready for a recommission. But what happened was, Family Guy went onto DVDs in the bargain basements, in the bargain buckets at the end of retail kind of conveyor belts, and people took the DVD, and they ripped it, and they stuck it on fledgling social media as it was then, MySpace and early Facebook. They used the clip strategy without even knowing it. They stuck Family Guy into their social spaces, and it took off. The noise erupted. People loved and got involved and became advocates of something that had been canned. Uh, Fox saw what was happening. They saw the noise, immediately recommissioned it, and thus a 20-year-old property was born. Music is, of course, the common denominator so much here when we talk about fandom. Back in the noughties, there was a British band from the north of England in Sheffield called the Arctic Monkeys. They were widely sort of assumed to be the band of the early social media era because of fandom. But the misnomer, the mistake people made, is they say it's because of MySpace. The technology made them. It wasn't. They toured relentlessly around the north of England and created this cultivated this incredible fan base of very young people who knew every lyric and every word to every song. They gave out demo tapes after every show, and the kids ripped them and stuck them on MySpace. Arctic Monkeys never told them to. It was never a marketing ploy. It wasn't a manager's kind of wish, although it ended up being like their dream. But it was facilitated by MySpace, but not as a cause of the tech. It was down to the fans. You might recall at this era as well, in the early years of Twitter, where scriptwriters would create things called Twitter bombs for fans of a television program. So they would have us all, captive audiences, watching our TV show, and then hide incendiary pieces of writing within the script, within the narrative, so that we would all explode in humor or rage or surprise on Twitter, and other people would tune in accordingly, following the trend. But culture moved on. That was then, and we haven't stayed still. And when we're thinking in a conference like today and the importance of technology and Web3, the likes of AI, fandom doesn't sit like it once did. Culture now is this myriad. It's like a bunch of paradoxes that all coexist. For starters, in the music world that we've referenced already a couple of times, we don't ask our friends for recommendations. We tend to obey the algorithm. We search for music on a Monday or a Friday because a DSP called Spotify tells you to. We discover a weekly or release radar. And likewise, we supercharge our algorithms. If we want more terror rap in a playlist, then we deliberately insert a track that feels like that into our playlist to make the rest of it do the same. TikTok, of course, which is all the apex predator right now of social, does this in spades. Subsequently, if you're going barbecuing in the outback this weekend, uh, odd choice of uh, example, then you're going to go onto TikTok and look for affiliate content, which of course will suddenly bring up a load more content. That's the way it works for us now. 
but it's leading us to this interesting place. TikTok's influence on society. You've got accelerated music, sped up pop songs that personally I hate, but it's a reality of now. The bottom left example is great though, where it's creating this culture of adjacencies and arresting juxtapositions. So that tiny bottom left diagram you might be able to see is on a whiteboard from a school. They asked a bunch of 13 year old boys what they thought they should be taught in school. Not what they are being taught, what they thought they should be taught in school. Their answers were NFTs, crypto, rap, fitness, helping Ukraine. There was a mix of purpose driven and then like classics like cycling mechanics and then kind of the likes of crypto and technology. The point is, this is young people right now. That myriad mix, that almost assault on the senses. As a friend once wrote on my LinkedIn about TikTok, swiping is like playing cultural roulette. So that's the kind of space that we're currently in, which is very different to 20 years ago. There's more too, live streams became mainstream. We expect a live event exactly like this to be hybrid. It's live streamed at the same time. There's clips going out, there's archive content. That's just a given, much of it born from the pandemic. This kind of long form v short form debate isn't really a debate. If the content's good, then it's gonna fly. Short form is in the ascent with YouTube shorts and TikTok and reels and stories, sure. But a teenager will still, will still watch four hours of side men Sunday quite happily captivated. If the content's good enough, people remain. So it's never been a more mixed up, kind of myriad paradoxical time for culture. Much of this as well we're seeing is people are resenting A, the sheer amount of channels available to them and B, the toxicity or the trolling it exists. They revert and resort to closed social spaces, social safe havens, more innocent places of WhatsApp groups where you can talk and trade information and converse. And our new sort of leaders of today are no longer politicians, very disenfranchised and disaffected by what's been going on politically around the world in a post-populist time. They're certainly not the royalty of 20, 30 years ago and the respect that they had. Instead, it's athletes and artists. It's perhaps the people who would have been on my bedroom wall when I was a 15, 16 year old. These are the people now making a change, making the difference. Stormzy, a British rap artist, runs Murky FC, a sort of coalition of the willing, trying to up the amount of people of colour in the C-suite, in businesses and brands, which is an incredible cause. Footballers like Vinicius Junior in Real Madrid, or Raheem Sterling in Chelsea, who are figureheads against racism, or Marcus Rashford here, who does all that he can to sort of prevent child property in the year, prop property? poverty. <coughs> in the UK, like this is a young Mancunian footballer changing actual government legislation. So talent have become jaded, they're sick of the trolls, they're sick of also spilling out individual bits of content quite unknown to millions of people supposedly getting a very kind of checkered comment history back but knowing the data's not theirs anyway. It's owned by Zuckerberg or it's owned by Musk or someone else in between. And what's more, and perhaps very recently this is becoming more aware, you might have heard of the Insta repeat piece that's going on, is that we're all starting to look the same. When we live in an algorithmically controlled world where everything's for you, recommended for you, because you might like, because they wanted it to, everything gets more beige, everything gets more samey, everything gets a little bit vanilla. User-generated content used to be this bastion of kind of variety and difference and anything goes, but now, UGC looks the same. Is it the right shot behind the shoulder, just in front of that waterfall that the other million people have been sent to because they saw it on the TikTok, TikTok hashtag? YouTube content around football is a great example. Sports documentaries. There's so much noise and clutter. That's a very whistle-stop tour of culture right now, but where does it leave fandom? Where does it leave the communities and what are we going to be heading to next? Now, one of the great bits of progress, if you like, in certainly the last couple of years has been within messaging environments. Look at Telegram, which I know some of you are on today, some of the guys at the festival use quite avidly. Look at Discord, you know, the almost powerhouse engine behind much of Web3, crypto, NFT kind of raising, if you like. Look at even WhatsApp, like the messaging environment is really, really important and it allows everyone to have a mic again. Fred again is a dance artist that many of you will know who's done wonderfully well out of the likes of Discord and Telegram where you use the power of the community and you have a direct relationship or as direct as you possibly can. But there is one more step and it is absolutely true and aligned to everything that we're talking about today and everything that we've been talking about so far this morning in some of those great talks. When we consider a more Web3 way of doing things, 
it surely feels a much more appropriate place for fans to exist. A place where fans can flourish without the fear of the toxicity and a place where talent can be kind of happy with what they have there. So the old ways, the old ways of fandom, which we all did, or certainly if you're 40 something like me, we would have crowded around the telly, we would have bought the t-shirt, maybe we bought the tickets to the gig. And then we had the social ways. Hey, we can either comment. I wonder if they'll see it. God, someone might actually feed back. That's kind of nuts. But then do you know what? There might be a bit aggro. There might be a few trolls kicking off. Social toxicity became a thing. The new ways though, what Web3 affords us and what hopefully lots of the kind of sentiment of a festival and a conference like this is, is that one-to-one -one relationship, that ability to have genuine proximity. We all want proximity. We all want closeness to our athletes and artists and stars. We want to feel like they're speaking to us, just like on that fan club model where you got the like facsimile of the signature. Oh my God, is that to me? Not really, it's a printout. But what if you can really do that? What if you can actually mint those moments and exchanges too? Those early fan clubs from the Beatles to Elvis Presley, if they could even know that how you could get such ownership, that proximity to talent, the trust that you can create too. And I guess this is the last few parts to leave you with before we get on this discussion is that those artifacts, those assets that can be created, we're saying it's like this almost forever handshake. Like it's physical, it's real, it's, it's, it's genuinely emotionally led. It's, it's very, very human being like, but it's stuff that can remain forever, not just thrown away or stored in an attic or stuck with the badge and the membership card that starts to rot in the back room. Because all we want to do when we're in these algorithmically controlled lives that we have sort of slept walked into, we want to be us. We want to be distinct or unique or bespoke or true to ourselves. We want originality. We're just looking to be us, actually, which doesn't feel like a, a big step. And if you look at things like meme culture and meme mentality that is so prevalent creatively, well, historically, as in the last few years, they're so transient. They appear and we laugh, they exhibit and elicit an emotional reaction and then they're gone. Well, what if they're not gone and you can create and maybe even store them forever or have an almost commercialized version of them? We're seeing more and you know, we had Erica from Adidas speaking earlier. Adidas have made recently a, a shoe out of the Homer Simpson disappearing into the hedge meme. It's a collab with Stan Smith. These are creative moments. On the left there is a guy from Squid Game who only became famous from the memes of Squid Game, now a model on the front of Arena uh, wearing Adidas, so he's effectively a meme model. He would never have been there were it not for the memes that you all probably shared and propagated and passed on and moved on as a result of watching the show. So that is all there to be owned better, to be when you're a fan you can both create and kind of own, maybe there's commercials too. I think the pandemic, although I dislike speaking about it too much, changed an awful lot. We kind of suddenly demanded more for our relationships with talent as innate fans. When I was working in music at the time, lots of artists and DJs who were previously a bit arms length, they go and collect their considerable fee after playing on some decks quite away from an audience and then they go away. Suddenly they weren't doing that. So they were leaning in, doing Zoom interviews, doing backstage kind of virtual experiences. It was all about proximity, albeit behind a screen. Artists, and bands and athletes and stars and people who elicit fandom in all of us, they realize that's more important than ever. Just last week, the Beatles released Now and Then. And I think this is a great example of where humanity and fandom and new technology and the spirit of the old collide and come together. John Lennon wrote three tracks in 77, uh, Free as a Bird, Real Love, both of which were released and re-released and edited and recorded, but now and then just wasn't good enough quality. The technology in the 90s, when they tried to revisit it, didn't exist. The use of AI has allowed them to actually bring out John Lennon's voice and take it away from the piano that was at times muffled and the guitar in the background from the 90s version and elevate it and nothing artificial. There's nothing that's been created uh, artificially, but it's the AI that's allowed them to create such a lovely distinction and allow us to hear his voice in its true glory again. And then when the Beatles released that, you just saw what was going on on socials. Celebrities and artists and people were crying. It was the most emotional response from a track recorded in the 70s, brought back to life in 2023 as an original, but remastered, recut, re-edited. 
That kind of coming together is what it's all about. And this quote from The Atlantic, for me, surmises it and says it all. Through the tools we create, we become neither less human, nor superhuman, nor post-human. We just become more human. And for me, that's the whole point of this talk. And when we're talking about fans and we're talking about communities and the offer that affords us, technology to make us more human is everything. Thank you.